I'm Reinhold Martin. I direct the Buell Center here, uh, and um, we've met many of you uh, either here in various presentations about this project or in Philadelphia. Um, and so, uh, and for those who are new to this conversation here at GSAP, welcome. And, and we actually are very pleased to see that there are even uh, uh, quite recently um, uh, requests, shall we say, if not demands, to keep it going. Uh, so uh, into next semester and beyond. So, um, so if anything we can do to help on that front, uh, let us know. Um, in the meantime, so uh, just to get us started, I, I wanted to quickly repeat some comments I made um, at the event at University of Pennsylvania, uh, designing a Green New Deal. A couple, um, which m uh, many of the students here, uh, 150 in fact, uh, attended. Um, today's event, in many ways, continues the Penn discussion, uh, which was uh, organized there by Billy Fleming uh, of the McCarg Center, uh, Kate Aronoff, uh, and uh, Daniel Aldana-Cohen, who Daniel is here uh, among our guests this afternoon. Um, at the Buell Center here at, at Columbia, we, uh, which is dedicated mainly to research and public programming, uh, we take uh, very seriously our pedagogical responsibilities. I tried to emphasize that over there and want to re restate that here because really we see this as a sort of teaching exercise uh, in, in which we, we teach ourselves, we learn from one another um, around these issues. Uh, and, and the we includes, uh, uh, more narrowly here at the Buell Center, Associate Dr Director Jacob Moore and Program Manager Jordan Steingard, uh, both of whom we must thank yet again for bringing us together and for doing all the work that has helped the, the curricular initiative uh, uh, get off to such a smooth start, including getting many of you to Philadelphia. Um, uh, with many collaborators, uh, including uh, student researchers, uh, we've therefore, um, we've also built a teaching resource, a website, I'm not gonna show that to you right, right now, um, called Power, uh, Power in, in all of its senses. Um, that features critical writing, analysis, documentation, and related materials at the intersection of climate, infrastructure, politics, and life. So if you haven't had a chance to have a look at the Power website, I encourage you, encourage you to do so for a sort of larger context for some of this conversation. Now among the uh, initiatives you'll find there is the one we're, here to, we're focusing on here today, Public Works for a Green New Deal. Uh, a group of nine classes here at Columbia GSEP this fall, supported by the Buell Center in collaboration with Dean Amal Andros, uh, five uh, arch architectural design studios, I'm just reiterating, five architectural design studios, the entire urban design studio, uh, and, and three design and planning seminars, um, all of which are taking HR 109, the Green New Deal resolution, essentially as their teaching brief. Uh, and which amounts to about 150 students from all over the world. And that's the part I want to emphasize uh, this afternoon. Um, since although the GND in the form that we're discussing this as a House resolution, congressional resolution, is US based, um, the rela relations of climate change and society on which it centers are of course, are not just planetary or global. Um, from a social, political, and technical point of view, they are precisely transnational, transregional, and transcultural. And, and, and I know that, that, that it's this kind of uh, tension between a, a particularly US-based project uh, and uh, the many, many uh, inputs, including personal experience, previous education, uh, and so on, language that, that, that all of you bring to, to our, our shared sort of table here. And, uh, and we want to take those inputs very seriously in this sense. So, you know, because we cannot assume that we all speak the same language um, on these matters, literally or figuratively, um, uh, which, as I said, therefore is an issue that I, I, I hope that somehow we can explore in this afternoon's discussion um, uh, to better measure the scale, scope, and texture of what I think, nevertheless, we can still call the climate justice public sphere. Um, so as I also uh, announced at Penn, uh, to open up that sphere as far as possible, on Sunday, this is sort of the, the one, the event on the right, you see our two events over here. Um, on Sunday, <clears throat> November 17th, uh, the, the Buell Center is co-organizing 
uh, a public assembly on the Green New Deal at the Queen's Museum together with colleagues at the museum, the architecture lobby, the New York chapter of the AIA, and our architectural comrades, uh, Francisco Casablancas and, and uh, Francisco Casablanca, sorry, and, and Gabriel Hernandez, Hernandez uh, Solano. Um, now you'll notice that the um, Queen's Museum is located in Representative Ocasio-Cortez's congressional district, New York 14. Um, so it's an excellent place to take, the, take another step of, uh, in, uh, in thinking and learning together about the GND, in a sense, uh, in one of its sources. Um, there, uh, at this event, uh, activists, organizers, professionals, and ac academic specialists, and elected officials, including at least one member of Congress, uh, will work with numerous publics affected by the toxic mix of injustice, inequality, and planetary warming uh, on what specifically must change on the ground, what, when, and how. So reconnecting policy with politics at all scales, which is the, one of the larger ambitions of this whole enterprise, and turning uh, the regionalist framework that I know some of you have been discussing uh, of the so-called original, the quote-unquote original New Deal on its head, um, we hope to model in Queens at this event a kind of situated democratic assembly that can be replicated around the country. So it's not to be definitive, it's, the idea is to try to just to, to practice a little bit. Uh, this, 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 the kind of democracy we have in mind, uh, and around the world. Uh, the Green New Deal as democratic process as well as transformative project. Um, so you're, you're all invited to join us um, uh, there in Queens in, in November, on November 17th. Um, and then as you, as you see here, the, here, back here in New York at, at GSAP, uh, the, uh, the work that's coming out of the, the, the classes that we're gonna discuss here uh, will be featured in a, uh, what we call a super crit with another of the, uh, our colleagues in the larger collaboration, Kate Aronoff, uh, the journalist Kate Aronoff, um, who, uh, who will respond to those projects. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, we wanna take some time today uh, to look more closely at specific aspects of the built environment to kind of bring it down, in a sense, closer to the ground. Um, uh, and uh, related to the, to, to the teaching here at GSAP, uh, in order to help give greater specificity to the discourse and debates around the Green New Deal and beyond those debates, um, <coughs> including both its larger ambitions and the conflicts uh, and indeed the contradictions that the proposal addresses. Toward that end, uh, I'm gonna f what I'm going to do is first hand things over to my GSAP colleagues, each of whom will very, very, very briefly uh, describe, they'll introduce themselves and, just, and briefly describe um, the, the course, uh, the aims of the course that they're teaching, after which I'll, I'll come back and introduce our speakers, and then we'll, we'll head straight into the discussion. Uh, so I will just hand it over to the GSAP faculty. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is David Benjamin. I'm teaching one of the design studios that Reinhold mentioned. Um, and just for the context, uh, for those of you who aren't based in this school, um, this, the uh, design studios are the um, design studios for third year MARC students and second semester AAD students. So those are, if you're thinking in terms of, uh, of some other schools, it's like MARC 1, the third year, second to last semester, and MARC 2, also the second to last semester. They're combined. We have 18 advanced studios, um, and five of them are, are part of this initiative here. Okay, so now uh, my studio. It's called Climate Design Core, Reinventing Architecture, Labor, and Environment. So first, labor. In 1802, the United States Army Corps of Engineers for was formed to deliver public engineering services, uh, energize the economy, and reduce the risks from disasters. In 1931, the Civilian Conservation Corps was launched to create immediate jobs and train unemployed young men for future jobs constructing roads, dams, and bridges. In 1961, the Peace Corps was established with the aim of supporting the de uh, development in other countries and promoting mutual understanding through voluntary service. The goal here was social and cultural, as well as technical and economic. In 1993, AmeriCorps was launched as a domestic version of the Peace Corps. The idea was for young members to serve in nonprofit organizations and public agencies addressing education, health care, and environmental protection. So in the spirit of these organizations, 
uh, this studio that I'm teaching is imagining a new climate design core, taking a critical look at the earlier models and reinventing them in the context of public works and the Green New Deal. Like its predecessors, our core will call upon young people to commit to a year of service, to work together in teams, to receive training for future meaningful jobs, and to work for the public good. Similar to many of the individual AmeriCorps programs, our core will emphasize diversity of participants and promote social equality through collaboration. But our core will be more environment focused than AmeriCorps and more design focused than any of the precedent cores. We will imagine that our core is one of the primary elements of the Green New Deal, addressing the climate crisis with urgency and committing to leave no one behind during the radical transformation required. We will also suppose that the key to successful transformation is design and the built environment. Second, architecture. In 1973, a young Swiss architect named Walter Stahel was looking for ways to save large amounts of energy in the construction industry. Instead of looking at technologies such as more efficient lighting or cooling, Stahel turned to behavior patterns and socioeconomic issues, and he concluded that these problems could be best addressed by what he called substituting manpower for energy. In a report called Jobs for Tomorrow, he wrote, the creation of new skilled jobs can be achieved in parallel with a considerable reduction of the energy consumption through a prolongation of the useful life of materials and products, and we could also say buildings. Of course, much has changed since 1973, but Stahill's original argument about the need to look simultaneously at fossil fuel consumption and fulfilling employment is as relevant as ever. In addition to inventing a new climate design core, this studio is considering how architects might design jobs and low carbon materials, as well as buildings and overall environmental impact. It will explore how labor inequality are necessary factors when considering urgent environmental issues and it will address design in the context of time and change, conceiving of buildings as open source systems rather than static objects. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Fu Huang. Uh, I'm also teaching one of the Advanced Five Architecture Studios. Uh, it's called Being With, Coexistence at a Planetary Scale. The studio begins by um, rethinking the boundaries of what we think of as public works. So. Um, what's considered both public and what's considered works. Uh, rather than public, the studio looks at the, uh, proposes the idea of publics, designing for multi-species, both human and non-human. So animals, in insects, plants, fungi, and bacteria are how we're beginning the studio. Coexisting in both built and natural environments. Being with is about coexistence. It's not based on the idealism of a kind of human self-sufficiency, but instead it's rooted in democratic modes of living with other than human species. It's really about making space for multi-species living. Works is similarly not just about works as we understand it, limited to architectural, infrastructural, or technological scales, but also includes the planetary scale, biospheres, climate change, marshlands, in the face of our climate crisis. This incremental understanding of scale, I think, is at the core of a misunderstanding in the environment, uh, both architecturally and in terms of technology. We understand, understand scales incrementally, the scale that we're in, and a few scales up and a few scales down from that. But as practitioners of design, we have to think about the planetary scale simultaneously to how we, when we're designing ha at the scale of habitats. <coughs> this image um, is uh, from uh, Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. It's a kind of inspiration image for the studio in which human and other than human, uh, humans and other than humans intermingle in a game of exquisite corpse. People turn into animals that turn into musical instruments and kitchen utensils and back again. The boundaries between things and their differences in scale begin to fall apart. So the studio, um, we, we're traveling. We leave tomorrow for New Orleans and coastal Louisiana. Um, we are going there because it's both a studio site, but it's a good place to actually experience the climate crisis firsthand. It's an area that has, um, loses one, uh, one, New York, uh, one New York City block to rising sea levels every six hours. Um, so we're going on a shrimp boat. We're going to visit um, the disappearing barrier islands and the marshlands. We're going to be kayaking through um, salt marshes and then meeting with some of the um, let's say, uh, frontline communities, in particular the Vietnamese fishermen um, who are most at risk uh, in the area. 
So really it's about, it's a trip that's about making or designing space for the other species. The students in the studio are looking right now at alligators, mangroves, bees, lichen, oysters, and mushrooms, all at um, species scale and at planetary scales. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andres Jaque, and we're doing a studio in which we, many people are there, uh, looking at uh, transterritorial publicness. Uh, basically, we raise this question, is this what green public architecture look like? Everyone immediately would say no, of course no. But actually, in cities like New York, since the 1980s, a significant part of the public realm, its budget, its policy making capacity, its innovation and mediating potential, has been devoted to instigate the rise of a particular regime, hyencracy. Architecture has been an important accomplice in this process. Uh, if we are very pragmatic, if we look at very specifically to the components of this architecture, we would immediately pay attention to the glass. All 18 super towers being now built in New York are cladded with ultra clear glass, also known as low iron glass. It was patented in 1989 by PPG Industries from Pittsburgh, of course. It eliminates the greenish tone that iron imprints in clear glass. Ultra clear glass is an industry that keeps growing and growing. It is estimated that by 2025, the annual revenue of ultra clear glass will double the one that we have now. High end office, residential, hospital buildings, as well as, for instance, Bentley or Audi cars, uh, use ultra clear glass. Contemporary power is encapsulated in ultra clear glass. When seen in its larger socio-territorial context, the existence of ultra-clear glass is directly related to a great number of transformations that have reshaped entire regions of rural America. For instance, to reduce the cost of mining the low iron, of mining the low iron silica needed in its production, it is extracted through surface mining that facilitates the dispersion of such a thin sun, producing an exponential growth of silicosis and carcinoma in Wisconsin and Illinois. In ultra-clear glass, removing uh, iron oxide results in the need of doubling the amount of energy in the ovens in order to reach higher, higher temperatures able to melt silica sun. The overall result is 10 times increase in the emissions of CO2 and 25 times in NOx emissions, which has brought the states where ultra-clear glass is produced to constant atmospheric alerts since 2015. Uh, and this is what, what is really critical and what we're very much looking at. Ultra clear glass is commercialized, commercialized as a tool to improve the environmental performance of buildings. Ultra clear glass provides a neutral base that increases the effectiveness of radiation shielding coatings. Paradoxically, the mere use of ultra clear glass in a building makes it automatically earn two points in the lead energy and environmental design rating system as ultra clear glass led it has a lead uh, verified environmental product declaration. Ultra clear glass is showing the conflict of the material culture of sustainability that looks at material solutions in a techno-deterministic way without reconstructing the overall techno-social context they contribute to produce. Uh, who is not actually attracted to this? Uh, at the same time, our culture is addicted to clearness as much as we humans are addicted to techno-determinism making it possible for high-end buildings like this being now developed in downtown Manhattan directly related to unprecedented environmental damage to get more than $25 million annually of public money through tax abatements. As Arvin and Jose Luis are looking now in the, are looking at the office now. So the advanced studio that, that I'm uh, leading uh, works as an intervention to these ad uh, additions, addictions. We're revolting the use of public resources in these sites using a techno-social perspective to invent five prototypes of contemporary public infra infrastructures, five replacements, five uh, transterritorial notions of publicness as a proposal to be replicated and reproduced as a response to the context of the public wars for a Green New Deal. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kaya Kuhl. I'm the coordinator of the Urban Design Studio um, here at GSEP. So the Urban Design Studio is a team-taught studio. Um, Anna Deitch, David Smiley, Jerome Hafer, Justin Moore, Dragana Zoric, Shachi Pandi, Liz McEnany, and Rafi Rivero all teach the studio with me together. Um, and the students also work in teams, and so there's 56 of them. So maybe sort of uh, a bit of background for everyone who's not familiar with this. 
um, when Reinhold says the entire urban design studio, that's what he's talking about. It's a very coordinated effort. Um, all, um, I think it's nine of us that I just mentioned, um, are interacting with all 56 students. Um, to us, House Resolution 109 really reads like the brief for an urban design competition. I want to quote a few things that we read there. Building resiliency against climate change related disasters, repairing or upgrading the infrastructure, building more sustainable food systems, overhauling transportation systems, restoring and protecting threatened and endangered and fragile ecosystems. All of these are things that we consider sort of part of our work. And so when reading the document, we really felt like this is a charge for urban design to get to work and um, envision what um, the Green New Deal would look like. For um, the past several years, the urban design studio in the fall semester has been working in the Hudson Valley um, in, uh, or in coordination with the Hudson Valley Initiative here at GSAP, which I also lead, which is a community design uh, initiative that engages with community in the valley. And so now, too, we're interested in looking towards the region that feeds New York City um, to imagine what a Green New Deal would look like here in a region that's politically divided, um, that has historically been the source of power generation for New York City, and it represents a very mixed context from agricultural fields to small towns and villages, post-industrial cities, um, large sites of extraction, and suburban subdivisions. Um, and a strong legacy of environmental activism, actually. So um, the fight against Con Edison to stop the building of the Storm King power plant um, in the late 60s um, on the Hudson River has shaped national policy like environmental review procedures and ultimately the Clean Water Act. So it's a site that um, has a lot of history in, in thinking about the environment. What you see here um, is an image of our first review a couple of weeks ago where um, we traveled up the, re the river from Yonkers to try Troy, not uh, physically, by, but by virtue of building models of five by two mile sections of the river and the landscape to sort of understand the place a little bit. Um, and we just had our second review already yesterday where we began to map the region through the lens of 14 infrastructure systems. Um, and we want to understand both the territory through this mapping, but also unpack sort of the basic knowledge about the goals of the Green New Deal. So, um, and when we talk about infrastructure systems, we see this very broadly. We will be hearing about three of these systems that we looked at um, more today from our panelists, housing, um, transportation or mobility, um, and electricity. But the systems that we looked at um, also include health, um, libraries, forests, water, um, waste, real estate, asphalt, the economy, food systems, and um, politics. Um, in New York State, the three systems that uh, our speakers will be talking about um, make up about 60% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the state, so just tackling those is a big part of the picture, but the interconnectedness of the systems, I think, is also something that we all learned yesterday in our review and are looking forward to unpack for the rest of the semester. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Douglas Woodward, and I coordinate um, the, uh, the domestic planning studios and practice for the first-year planners, and I'm also the chief planning officer at Lincoln Center. Hi, Ariella Marin, co-teaching with Douglas. I have a firm line advisors that focuses on local government climate action and how to accelerate progress. Okay, so we don't have um, the 56 students that Kaya has, but um, but our approach with our 19 planning and policy students is um, to do a very close reading of, of the Green New Deal and to actually locate it within its tradition or genre, which I, I personally believe is the manifesto. And so we are looking at it as, as, as architecture, as urban design, as planning, and as text. Um, Roland Barthes has said that, that what we call real is never more that than a code of representation. It's never a code of execution. And the Green New Deal is about the best example of that we can see. Um, it, it's a text written not in the remotest expectation of passage. It's, it's something that, that its drafters knew would never actually become law at the present time. So, um, so we're looking at it um, as something that was written with the goal 
of expounding a theory of the desirable in American life at the present time and outline the critical structural changes that it considers necessary for, um, for the critical um, environmental and labor conditions that we find ourselves in. And, and we hope to ground this vision of the GND um, for the planning and policy students in today's science, economic, social, infrastructure, land use, and technological reality, um, while at the same time introducing what I like to call inspirations, which are these actual yet relatively small inside policies and strategies that are already being implemented across the U.S. that have objectives similar to the GND. And these are happening at different scales, different sectors, and across different systems. So in the course, we aim to facilitate discussions among the students to help them imagine and formulate what implementation of aspects of the GND may look like. And we do this by providing the students with the perspectives, frameworks, examples, and the space to step back and take on the challenges of, of this implementation in their capacity as current and future planners, policymakers, and change makers. And lastly, um, part of this includes encouraging curiosity, asking questions that centers this work on the people, and fosters the transformative, not incremental actions that are necessary. Um, but it's also encouraging a focus on governance and institutions, the role of government, the role of um, regulations, and the role of coalitions and communications, and how they all come together moving forward. Right. It's actually interesting that of the professors that we have up here teaching these nine classes, four of them worked at the Department of City Planning in New York. So, um, and just one quick thing about this slide as well. Um, on the left, this is a picture of a house in Vieques that was hit by both a hurricane and a tornado, and it was left by the residents of that part of Puerto Rico as an example of what, what happens during these events. I'm Thad Pulaski. I'm, I'm teaching a practicum also in urban planning, along with uh, coordinating it with Kate Orff, who's leading a group of urban designers. Um, you might have heard Kate talk about workshopping the Green New Deal in Philadelphia last week. We think that the Green New Deal is a call to action, and it really challenges us to rethink our methods as planners and urban designers. And one of the methods that we think is central to the current operations of our professions, but even more so in the future, is the workshop. We have to get really good at conducting workshops where we can co-create uh, design ideas and, and, and planning strategies with, with a broad interdisciplinary population. So in the classroom, we're working in between different disciplines. We have civil engineers and policy people in our classroom, but we're also uh, going to try to spend some time out in the field. So uh, I'm taking the class to my hometown, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, very exotic location. I'm, I'm very glad everybody signed up for this. Johnstown's in the, it's both in Appalachia and the Rust Belt. It sort of has over lapping concerns of post-industrial economy and a degraded landscape and um, a strong sense of despair that's been pervasive for about 50 years, which has been um, uh, you know, a, a hotbed for, for a growing sense of nationalism and radicalism and white supremacy. And, but, but it's not all bad. There's good things happening there, too. And we want to elevate those voices and have ha come together with voices in the community that want to see what a Green New Deal could mean on the ground. This is, uh, this is River Wall. Johnstown is known as the Flood City. It, w it flooded several times. In 1889, there was a flood that killed 3,000 people, sort of a, a, a mythic early natural disaster in, in US history. And, and the Works Progress Agency built these river walls, about uh, 24 miles of river walls in 1936. Uh, they're falling apart now, and nature's coming back. So we're, we're there to uh, help people think about what, what the river walls could be in the future. And so, yes, we're, we're um, going to work with these innovative techniques of listening and drawing. And we were just doing that last week on Governor's Island with the Our Futures Festival. Um, and so there's a little sketch of listening and drawing. Thanks. Hi, I'm Briny Roberts, and my studio is Structures of Care. It's one of the Advanced Five studios. Um, and so our studio is looking at the Green New Deal through the, the lens of the social justice elements of the proposal, and starting from the philosophical framework of the ethics of care. 
uh, this, this framework has been growing in popularity in social activism circles as well as ecofeminism. And it's looking at the intersection of environmental sustainability and social sustainability. So the studio is looking at care at multiple scales, thinking about land use, programming, labor, and materials. Our program is a childcare facility in Jackson Heights in Queens. And we're looking to a near future in which universal childcare is a reality, as described and proposed by Elizabeth Warren. Um, and in New York, it seems even more feasible given the amazingly successful rollout of universal pre-K. So we're looking to that really as a model. So in terms of public works, we're looking at social services as a really powerful tool for bringing resources and support into communities, um, for funding green building and sustainable land use, and also creating more equitable labor conditions. So the childcare facility, um, we're imagining it as a social anchor within a community land trust. The community land trust is also a growing phenomenon, particularly in New York, and it's a kind of collective land ownership that enables long-term affordable housing, um, affordable small business spaces, and also community spaces. So we're working closely with a community organization in Jackson Heights, Queens, called Chaya CDC. Um, they're just in the process of developing their proposal for a CLT, at community land trust. Um, and so we're working really closely to them, with them on identifying sites and really considering the feasibility of different locations for not only producing um, the possibility for supporting small businesses and affordable housing, but also creating a hub for social services with child care at the center. The students just presented their initial research yesterday, um, which was greeted with a lot of enthusiasm at Chaya, and it's been great to see how the research is really having um, a positive effect on the conversation about what's possible in that community. So um, it's also, this location is around the corner from AOC's office, so we're really hoping that this will also be part of a very real conversation about what's possible in the neighborhood. Um, in terms of the architectural design, the students are looking closely at the history of designing for children, thinking about um, designing spaces of play and learning, and looking at materials, um, in particular materials that are sustainable and non-toxic, but also create a kind of heightened sensory experience and interactivity for the children. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, experimental play already with jute and cork and textiles and different kind of tensile structures. So the idea is to create a very multi-scalar architectural proposal, thinking from the level of um, materials all the way to the, um, the regional issues of land use and ownership. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Suramaki. I'm also teaching in the advanced studio sequence. Um, and the studio I'm teaching really starts from the recognition that more than a set of ambitious goals and fundamental shifts in everything from agriculture to energy production, from transportation to social infrastructure, uh, the Green New Deal represents, in the words of AOC herself, an effort to, quote, uh, rediscover the power of the public imagination, unquote. In fact, the GND, which today really only exists as a, a relatively broad outline of principles, a non-binding resolution, uh, both inspires and relies upon an intersubjective assembly of images and ideas, visions of utopian change on the one hand, and projections of catastrophic environmental or economic collapse on the other. Uh, and indeed, it could be argued that the principal battleground on which the fate of the Green New Deal rests is not one of policy, but rather of perception, that its success depends on the degree to which it catalyzes a new form of social imaginary. Therefore, our studio examines how the Green New Deal might provoke new modes of conceptualizing the relationship between technology, society, and the natural world. Recognizing the crucial link between material culture and imagination, the hypothesis is that architecture's most potent role here may be its capacity to envision in precise spatial terms new ways of living in a profoundly transformed world. Uh, to do this, we're examining the implications of the Green New Deal through two seemingly disparate frameworks, one, the aesthetic and philosophical category of the sublime, and two, the emergent branch of speculative fiction known as cli-fi. Uh, given that we're confronted on a daily basis on our phones and new feed, news feeds with a continual spectacle of nature rendered destructive by human action, uh, the studio is looking at how issues of perception and representation have intersected in major technosocial movements of the past, uh, examining how the historical notion of, sub of the sublime, which is situated on the boundary between human inquiry and natural <laughs> phenomenon, might provide a lens through which to view our current crisis. At the same time, we're looking at how climate fiction um, both confronts and transfigures the incomprehensible realities of climate change, inhabiting the paradoxical uh, 
territory between elegy and resistance. Uh, in this spirit, the students are being asked to imagine a condition set 30 years into our future, the New York of 2050, a kind of modest leap by science fictional standards, engaging the complex interactions between environments, people, and technologies through specific scenarios within the larger New York metro region, oscillating between the plausible and the as yet unimaginable, between the utopic and the dystopic, between the logics of rational efficiency and the sublime, our projects seek new urban landscape and architectural formations to reconfigure the technosocial and political imagination. Thanks. You know, I mean, I, I won't delay further, but, but really, I mean, we could just spend about an hour talking about what we just heard, and I'm, I'm sure I know many of you are, um, all of you are in one way or the other. Um, but to help, uh, help uh, you know, build a, kinda, a different kind of frame around, around things that bridges a little bit, first of all, as I said, to the, to the discussion that we had in, in Philadelphia, and also to the, to the larger um, conversations, debates, controversies uh, that, um, that a number of our colleagues alluded to have uh, characterized our, uh, our, our civic discourse. Um, we have uh, we have four very very interesting uh, and and very uh, expert uh, colleagues to help us um, to 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 um, in a sense isolate but at the same time connect uh, different aspects of this highly complex question. So what I'm going to so so I'm just going to introduce everybody all at once, uh, and then they'll speak uh, each um, in turn. And, and, then, uh, and then we'll go into this sort of uh, panel discussion. We really are trying to leave as much time as we can for, for questions. So as you're sitting and listening, please you know, uh, start listing questions also in, in your heads, um, because really the goal here is to, is to open up for, for a discussion um, of some length towards the end. So on, uh, on the first on the topic of public housing, Daniel Adana Cohen, um, and I'm, by the way, I'm not holding to any of these topics, so this is just more or less how we've framed it. Um, <laughs> it Daniel Aldana Cohen, is an, a, 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 who was, as I said, one of the uh, co-organizers at Penn, is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he directs the Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative, or SC, was SC squared or SC2? SC squared. SC2. Um, in 2018-19, he was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And he, uh, uh, Daniel works on the politics of climate change, investigating the intersections of climate change, political economy, inequalities of race and social class, and political projects of elites and social movements in global cities of North and South, um, working on a book about housing, inequality, and climate politics in New York and Sao Paulo, uh, tentatively titled Street Fight, Climate Change and Inequality for in the 21st Century. And, um, he is co-author uh, of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, with Kate Aronoff, Alyssa Patistoni, who uh, will moderate the conversation, and Thea Rio Francos, uh, with a foreword from Naomi Klein. Uh, next, on public transportation, we are very pleased to have Haley Richardson join us. Haley is the Senior Communications Associate at Transit Center, an independent foundation based in New York uh, that works to improve public transit. Uh, when she's not spearheading Transit City's Green New Deal initiatives, uh, she's, and it really is, and we've already heard bits of this too, like uh, there's so much of this sprouting up in all different corners uh, of our city and of course well beyond. Uh, it's interesting also to connect those. Um, when she's not doing that, uh, she's directing the organization's video series, so I suppose there are videos to watch too. Um, uh, Haley has worked on livable streets in initiatives around the country and is an alumna of the George Washington University and Pratt Institute. Then on public electricity, uh, Abby Spinak, uh, who studies uh, energy, energy history with a particular interest in the politics of utility ownership and the role of infrastructure in disseminating economic ideas. Her current research ties the history of electrification in the rural uh, US uh, to the uh, evolution of 20th century American capitalism and alternative economic visions. She's currently completing a book, Democracy Electric, uh, Energy and Economic Citizenship in Urbanizing America, which explores how uh, a cooperative uh, business model came to be preferred for federal, federal electrification policy in the 1930s as a third option in a fierce debate about public versus private power. 
How a vast network of these community-owned and democratically managed utilities arose across the country, quickly and dramatically altering the American landscape, and how urbanizing communities variously interpreted the political opportunities of community ownership uh, at different moments over the past 80 years. Abby received her PhD in urban studies and planning at MIT, uh, and she's been a, a Charles Warren Center Fellow at the History of American Capitalism at Harvard, and recently held a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship in the energy humanities uh, at, uh, with, our, I suppose, our, our colleagues in the Cultures of Energy uh, project uh, at Rice University. And so to moderate uh, the, this uh, incredible group, we have uh, Alyssa, with us Alyssa Battistoni, who's a political theorist uh, and, an, and uh, currently an environmental fellow at Harvard University working on topics related to political, to political economy, environmental politics, feminism, and the history of political thought. Uh, she also writes uh, about the politics of feminism, labor, and environment for various publications, including The Nation, Dissent, N Plus One, and Jacobin, uh, where she is on the editorial board. And, uh, and she is a co-author, along with, with Daniel and uh, Kate Aronoff and Theo Rio Francos, of the book that you must go out and buy as soon as it comes out, um, A Planet to Win, uh, Why We Need a Green New Deal, uh, November, right? Forthcoming in, in November uh, with Verso. So with that, I, I invite Daniel to, to get us started. OK, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for letting me, as a frumpy sociologist, come to this fancy design school, architecture school. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about why we need a Green New Deal for housing. And I'll just note at the outset, and we'll get to it briefly, that I'm also now working for an organization called Data for Progress, which does a lot of polling, and the national campaign called the Homes Guarantee. Um, so let's see if this thing works. Um, I do some climate mapping, and we'll see a bit more of that later. But I think the big thing we want to get to right away is that the Green New Deal forces us to think proactively about the future and to think about the future and the present together and to learn from the future, even though it hasn't happened. So Roberto Unger, who's a fantastic social theorist, writes, we understand a state of affairs by grasping what it can become in a range of circumstances. The understanding of the actual is inseparable from the imagination of the possible, of the adjacent possible, of what can next happen or what we can make happen next. Now, this is probably not so controversial to designers, but to us social scientists, we are locked in the past at a time in which it provides poor or incomplete lessons for where we should go. Elizabeth Colbert in The New Yorker has talked about how we're going into a no analog future. Um, and so for figuring out what the Green New Deal is going to be, I'm going to argue that we need a constant interplay between a political economic analysis and a sort of experimental attitude towards what are the physical changes we can make right away and what are the big long-term changes that we need to be making very soon. And so when it comes to housing, I'm going to suggest that there are really three things we have to focus on. One is tackling inequalities, which is the decisive contribution of the Green New Deal, a massive attack on the social and racial inequalities that define our times. Um, second, we need to massively reduce the amount of energy that we use. And A Planet to Win is a book that I've co-authored with Alyssa, and the whole argument is structured around this idea that to provide solidarity for the rest of the world, the form of the Green New Deal in the United States has to include a dramatic reduction of energy use so that we can actually decarbonize by 2030, by 2035. Um, so when people tell you how hard it is to decarbonize because we have to build so much new clean energy, that's true. But the less energy we use, the faster we can decarbonize. And the third piece, what makes this different from green austerity, is that we're shifting from a logic of private consumption of things we don't really need to temples of public luxury to providing a new form of con consumption where we have more time to spend in play with the people we love. And to get there, we need one last green stimulus to create the landscapes of public communal luxury. And housing, I'm going to argue, is an absolutely central part of constructing a new physical world in which we can live with less resource intensity um, and love our lives all the more for it. Um, here, we'll skip ahead of things. So there's a long discussion already in, in design and in planning this idea that through housing and through urban changes, we can reduce energy use and then swap with clean energy. And there's an increasingly sophisticated conversation, which we'll get into a bit today, about how transformations to housing can be in a kind of um, 
complex sort of circle with the clean energy system. And I th this is what we really need to think about. So housing is not separate from decarbonization. It is not an add-on to decarbonization, but is the lever for decarbonization. Um, but again, in a way that provides communal luxury. Um, so the case for a Green New Deal for housing. So I want to make three quick points before I talk a little bit about precedence. Um, first of all, housing inequality is just as important as unemployment in terms of actually driving the miserable conditions that we see in this country. So the Green New Deal has talked a lot about a jobs guarantee, but if you want to understand racial inequalities in this country and the racial wealth gap, you have to go back to the housing system, which in fact came out of the New Deal in the form of redlining, which made it much easier for middle and upper middle class white families and even working class white families to buy homes, very difficult for black and brown families, so that there is a racial wealth gap with a ratio of almost 100 uh, to 1. Um, huge differential in the amount of wealth that families own, and it has everything to do with housing. Um, in addition to that, what we've seen in the last several decades is many attempts to use home ownership, home ownership for black and brown families as an escape from the racial wealth gap. And what you've had instead is what Kiangi Amata Taylor at Princeton calls predatory inclusion. So subprime, the mortgage boom in 2008 is just one example of a larger system where the efforts to include black and brown families in home ownership come through these forms of financial exploitation, which actually cause spirals of debt and poverty. So we want a different model. Um, the other thing is that the crises of home, of housing and, and energy and inequality all converge in American homes. So not only are renters unable to afford their rent, but one third of households in the United States can't afford their utility bills. And in a place like the Mid-Atlantic, half of black households have had to have a utility shut off, made a sacrifice in something like food to pay their energy bills, heating or air conditioning, um, or simply had to keep their home at an unsafe temperature. And when you think in, in cities like Philadelphia and Washington, DC, which will go from three days at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, to almost 30 within three decades, you understand how grave the situation is. So we can't think about the energy crisis separately from the crisis of inequality, which is very much a matter of homes. And finally, um, or in addition, we often think that people will say, oh, we don't really need to build that many new homes. We have all these empty luxury towers already. Why don't we just invade the new super glass towers of the wealthy, which I am all for, 100%. <laughs> But sea level rise alone will displace over 12 million people by the end of the century in the United States. We have heat, we have drought, we have a major obligation of the United States to welcome new immigrants and refugees to this country. So the question is, are we going to have concrete shacks? Are we going to have the private sector and new forms of predatory uh, loan making? Or are we going to have public luxury as a model for housing people? In, or put another way, what are the conditions under which the next great migration will have a democratic outcome and will feel good, rather than the previous great migration, which ended in a system that sociologists call American apartheid? Um, and then third, finally, of course, we need to decarbonize the building sector. Right? So homes alone, over 15% of US emissions, buildings in total, close to 40. Um, so sunflower homes. <laughs> This is an idea that I talk about in uh, the book with uh, Alyssa, Kate, and uh, Thea, which is an idea that when you have homes set up in the right way, you have all electric appliances, you can start to organize home energy use so that it literally follows the sun. You can put your clothes in the washer, and they will wash at 3 p.m. when the sun is beating down. Um, and you have minimum energy required for things like induction, stovetop cooking. But so, again, integrating the idea of the home and the energy system. Um, skip these, move ahead. OK, so the idea of combining housing and climate change is really growing in the United States right now. I think it would be a mistake to view this as simply a kind of technical question. If this is going to work, it's going to work because, as the Green New Deal proposes, by combining multiple issues together, by connecting the dots, we'll have bigger coalitions, bigger movements fighting for the things that we need. So I work on the um, policy team for the Homes Guarantee campaign. This is a campaign of a group called People's Action. And it's really motivated by organizations that are organizing tenants on the ground, groups like Community Voices Heard in New York, or KC Tenants in Kansas City. And we've put out this kind of uh, almost 20-page report uh, just on September 5th. And throughout the entire report, we have Green New Deal tie-ins, sort of talking about the different ways that we can do 
home retrofits, that we can do public housing that is zero carbon, that we can do green upgrades to existing public housing. Um, and there's been a huge amount of excitement from the movements on the ground saying like, yes, this is what we want. You know, we want to get in on the Green New Deal. We want to have a piece of this. And within two weeks, we've seen the Bernie Sanders campaign release its housing for all plan that literally endorses the homes guarantee. They say in the plan, we need a homes guarantee. The homes guarantee calls for 12 million new units of social housing in 10 years. Bernie's plan comes in a little low at almost 10 million new units of social housing a year. Currently, we produce none. It's actually illegal in the United States right now to produce new social housing. So we're going to have to change some laws. And the Bernie plan includes a huge section on decarbonizing housing, including decarbonizing public housing. So you're seeing this kind of like immediate groundswell. Um, and you'll see from the, the groups in Congress as well, I think you'll see from lawmakers pretty soon, um, a series of bills that are trying to combine climate change and housing. Um, in order to do this, we do need new forms of analysis. So I talked before about political economy. So I'm part of a group at Penn, SC2, Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative. And what you can see here is early stages of our mapping efforts for New York City. So the black dots are NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority. 400,000 people live in public housing in New York. So we find where are those housing units, which con congressional districts are they in, because the politics matter. Who is at risk of flooding? Those are the blue lines. And then if you look at the shading, what that tells you about is how much does your electricity cost as a percentage of rent? And as you can see, the lighter colored areas, sort of like in the South Bronx and much of the Bronx, you're looking at families paying around 20% as much in rent as they're in electricity. So huge electricity costs. And so what this is telling us is that we need, yes, absolutely to do upgrades in public housing, remediate mold, remediate lead, decarbonize, but you also have to invest in the communities around them because people literally cannot afford to keep cool in the summer or to keep warm in the winter during a polar vortex. So we actually also need to kind of create new forms of data analysis to try to understand how are these intersections going to work in practice. So we used to talk about connecting the dots and climate change was about connecting the story of a hurricane to climate change. Now connecting the dots is connecting the story between the built environment, social inequality, and climate change policy. Um, and it might seem like this is a huge political left, but these ideas are actually popular. Um, with the homes, uh, sorry, with Data for Progress, we've been pulling the core planks of a green homes guarantee or a green new deal for housing. And it turns out if you ask Americans, do you support green investment in frontline communities, racialized working class communities? Massive public support. Um, if you ask Americans, do you support weatherizing low income homes? Like billions and billions and billions of dollars a year, massive majority support. And even now, if you ask Americans, do you support investing tens of billions of dollars in building new public housing? You have massive amounts of support. So we have to think of this as this insane moment where people have an appetite to do really big things, and what are we going to offer, and what are we going to organize around that's going to solve many problems at once? Um, I want to take a minute to talk about a precedent that's been very important to me. When we think about social housing in the US, we inevitably think about the American model of public housing, which was really poorly maintained housing viewed as a kind of last resort for very poor people. But there is another form of social housing model, and the one that excites me the most is the model of Vienna. Um, in Vienna 1919, you have the formation of a new country, Austria. In Vienna, the Social Democrats are elected. This is the left-wing party. And in Vienna, the Social Democrats, the left, have literally never lost an election. Have literally never lost an election. They were defeated in a civil war by Nazis, not neo-Nazis, but Nazis, in the 1930s. Um, and in Vienna in the 1920s, they built enough public housing to, to house 10% of the city's population. Very, very high quality. Um, and now, in Vienna today, building on this legacy, one third of the housing is public, one third of the housing is cooperative, and one third of the housing is private. And Vienna's carbon emissions are through the floor. So this is what public housing looks like in Vienna. Um, this is what cooperative housing looks like in Vienna. And this is the result of decades and decades of organizing, starting again at the beginning of the 20th century, public health movement, labor movement, feminist movement, with increasingly an ethics of care that we were talking about earlier in all of the housing um, developments. So you can see me here visiting the Karl Marx Hof. The Karl Marx Hof. <laughs> I carry a knapsack, very nerdy, um, real research. Karl Marx Hof is the most famous of these temples of public housing. It was built to house 
1,200 uh, people um, in the 1920s. It was literally shelled, literally shelled in the 1930s and 1934 during the Civil War. Um, it had a library, it had a dental clinic, it had a community theater, really, really, really beautiful housing. And it's important to note that the architect, um, the political architect of the Red Vienna housing program, of which Karl Marx Hoff forms a part, was murdered in Auschwitz uh, in 1942. So this was very much in Vienna, as today, a struggle between life and death, um, the struggle over housing. And that's very much what the struggle of climate politics is about. Um, so public housing was built by taxing the rich. They literally taxed champagne to help build public housing. One third of the funds to build public housing came from luxury taxes. Um, so it seems like this is a story about Europe, but there is an interesting connection between the European Viennese experiment and what happened in the US. And it comes in the form of Roland Wonk, who was a Hungarian architect who immigrated to the United States in 1924. He had spent some time in Vienna. He came to the US like many immigrants because he wanted to have a different and more exciting life. Other immigrants come for other reasons, but that was why he came. And he built in the Lower East Side of New York, still standing, an homage to the Karl Marx Hof, which is a cooperative that was built for socialist garment workers in New York City. Gardens, there was rooftop with balconies so that workers could dance into the night. Beautiful Art Deco fixtures. 50% of the lot is garden, which is extremely high in Manhattan then and now. And Wonk went on from working on housing to working on public energy. So Wonk became the chief architect of the Tennessee Valley Authority um, in 1934. And he went on to design dams all across the southern US. He also helped to, to the steward the Rural Electrification Association. And what Wonk said about the public power was he said, this can't just be an object. This has to be a beautiful feature of the landscape. And he designed um, dams to have viewing, uh, sort of these viewing platforms that the public would go to, these elaborate roads that people would come on to see the dams so that it would look, in the words of his um, eulogist, like a forest, uh, sorry, like the Acropolis coming out from behind the forest. And four and a half million Americans, four and a half million Americans visited these dams in the 1930s. So there was an idea that both housing and public power had to be beautiful, had to be for, of, and by people. It wasn't perfect. There was a huge amount of racism in the New Deal. But there is a vision we can kind of recuperate of trying to connect the energy system and the housing system. And I want to end by noting um, an essay that Roland Wonk wrote called Nowhere to Go But Forward in 1941 for the magazine of art, because it speaks to us now. Um, the point of Wonk's essay was, what should architecture do at a time of insane instability, at a time of incredible struggle over the fate of humanity? This was early 19. 40s, right? The full-on World War II about to swallow Europe. And what Wonk says is that security is no longer within the independent reach of even the most powerful individual. Wealth no longer comes in forms which may be hoarded within four walls. Permanence itself may be an anachronism in a world of accelerating change. And he goes on to say, he goes on to say that architects have to see themselves not as a special super kind of Cast, who have to design everything for the world, but he says to plan a housing development, a roadside restaurant, a school, or a powerhouse is not of itself very different nor more useful than to mend boots, run a lathe, or total up accounts. But to share in a forward struggle when the fight is hot and passion runs high is one of the vital experiences that make life worth living, and that makes contemporary architecture fun. So my plea to you is join this movement for the Green New Deal. Think with the future, learn from the past, and remember, with all of us, there's nowhere to go but forward. Thank you. Wonderful to be here with you all, and I just want to give a shout out to all the people that are striking for the climate today. We see you. Um, I work at Transit Center. We're a New York-based foundation that advocates for better public transit in the US. We do that through a variety of ways. Uh, we conduct research into what matters to transit riders. Uh, we do grant making to build community power in cities across the US to fight for better transit. We do uh, technical trainings for transit and agency practitioners to teach them about international best practices. Um, and we also do advocate, advocacy ourselves here in New York City. Um, so I want to start out by talking about federal transportation policy. Uh, because it's been uh, largely a failure in the United States. Um, it has failed to produce useful transit, and that has been a disaster for social equity and the climate. So the Green New Deal resolution 
by invoking public transit, however briefly, invites us to imagine a different future and to think about how we might reorient federal transportation policy to achieve better outcomes. As many of you probably know, transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. We have sprawled and paved our way into the most energy uh, uh, dependent transportation system in the world. And uh, this has been a disaster um, for public health, not only in terms of harmful pollution that it produces, but also in terms of the hundreds of thousands of deaths that occur on our roadway every year. Through the Federal Highway Trust Fund, uh, transportation policy delivers billions of dollars a year to road expansion in the US. And what this means is that we are still building highways through low-income neighborhoods and spewing pollution onto frontline communities. And just in case you thought that this was something that happened in your history books, cities like Portland, Denver, and Houston still have plans to expand highways through neighborhoods. 80% of federal transportation funding goes towards roads, which obviously leads 20% left over for public transit. But what's perhaps more insidious is the fact that road funding is distributed with very few strings attached, no goals, no ways of measuring outcomes, whereas transportation, transit projects are asked to scrape and claw for every dollar they receive. So what this means is that outside of a few urban centers in the US, we mostly have a patchwork of low frequency transit systems that are dwarfed by highways um, that encourage sprawl and uh, all but um, force a car-based lifestyle onto us. So transit funding is primarily administered through the Federal Transit Administration's Capital Grants Program. And so that might sound well and good, um, but the problem with this program is that it often funds the wrong type of transit projects. So you'll see um, uh, uh, transit expansions in the middle of freeways that force people to walk across multiple lanes of traffic and wait in dirty, noisy stations just to take the train. Um, you'll also see uh, projects that extend rail into far-flung exurban places that have no hope of achieving any kind of ridership and help to make the case to skeptical legislatures that we shouldn't fund transit because nobody rides it. We also see uh, the FTA fund projects like uh, mixed traffic streetcars, um, which are sort of done under the guise of economic development rather than actually providing people with useful, reliable transit. So since the 1990s, um, the FTA has only provided very small transit agencies with operating assistance, which means that most are on the hook for coming up with revenue to fund operations themselves. Um, they do that through local taxes, uh, as well as through fair revenue. But it's wildly insufficient. Most transit agencies are woefully underfunded, which leads to a vicious cycle of poor service, leading to low ridership, leading to further service cuts, leading to, as I mentioned, a further public unwillingness to make investments in transit systems. So access to transit is a huge determinant of socioeconomic so, sorry, let me restart. Access to reliable transportation is a huge determinant of people's ability to um, make progress um, in terms of socioeconomic mobility. Uh, so we know that transportation is the number one determinant for whether somebody can escape poverty. And so this graph is showing the number of jobs that you can reach uh, by driving in 30 minutes in New Orleans versus how many jobs you can reach by transit. Um, as you'll see, there's a radical discrepancy, and this uh, trend holds in just about every major U.S. city. So people that are transit dependent are forced to contend with broken, broken and missing sidewalks, um, faded or non-existent crosswalks, a lack of ADA accessibility, um, bus stops that are basically just a pole in the ground um, just to get to work, um, to school, to wherever they need to go. So the contemporary discourse about transportation in a Green New Deal has largely centered on electrification of the vehicle fleet. And you'll see that reflected in many of the Democratic candidates' uh, climate plans. Um, but it's really important to point out that 
Electrification is important, but it's radically insufficient to solve our transportation problem. As the California Air Resources Board recently concluded, we absolutely have to reduce driving if we have any chance of meeting our emissions targets. And Project Drawdown is a climate modeling organization, and they also concluded that electrification is just one of myriad policies needed to meet emissions targets by 2030. We need to make it much easier to walk in bike places, as well as put reliable frequent transit uh, within reach of a much greater um, number of Americans. And furthermore, uh, an electri electrified vehicle based transportation system is much more energy intensive, which makes all of the other initiatives we want to undertake that much harder. And it's also important to point out that a lot of the harmful health matter from cars actually comes from um, the tires and the roadway wear, not just what's coming out of the, the tailpipe. So from that perspective, electric, <laughs> electric vehicles don't solve our problem at all. And there's also the issue that car ownership is a trap. And if we continue on this path of forcing people to spend $30,000 a year just to participate in society, we have failed. There are 7 million Americans that are currently underwater on their car loans because they had to buy a car because they couldn't rely on transit to get to work. Once again, electrification, even with generous subsidies, does not solve this problem. So a lot of the opposition to the Green New Deal frames it as a sacrifice. And while it's true that we will have to change the way that we move around, if we do it right, it won't feel like a sacrifice. Transit that comes every three to five minutes, sidewalks everywhere, that'll enable you to go where you want to go without having to get in your car, that's not a sacrifice. Transit that feels like a life hack, like you're getting away with something. Uh, temples of public luxury, as Daniel talked about. <clears throat> so how do we get there? The first thing is that federal transportation policy needs to set goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's shocking that they haven't done it yet. Um, we also need to set goals to reduce vehicle miles traveled. We also could set a federal goal of putting a certain percentage of Americans within walking distance of frequent transit. We need to stop building highways. Any, new, any federal money, money that's going towards roads needs to be dedicated to wringing more capacity out of the roads that we already have by adding bus or HOV only lanes. We should also incentivize states to tear down highways and replace them with street grids that encourage walking and biking. So it's always infrastructure week in Washington, and, uh, and a lot of the debate about transportation does involve infrastructure, but really we need more service. Um, we could double the amount of transit ridership tomorrow if we decided to put resources into running service. And you know, Canadian cities have double the per capita transit ridership that we do, and it's just because they run more service. Um, another thing is that we should exempt transit priority projects like this red bus lane in Boston from environmental review. It has inherent environmental benefits. We should be green lighting these kind of projects. <clears throat> we should also be putting transit where the people are. We shouldn't be building expensive rail lines to the cornfields because a member of Congress really wants it to happen. We should put federal funding towards projects in places where the highest number of people will ride it, like the long languishing Utica Avenue subway line in Brooklyn. We also need to make walking much, much easier, and state transportation agencies should have leeway to spend federal funds on basic upgrades, like sidewalks and ADA access. Using tactical methods, like this project in Seattle, we could improve access practically overnight for Americans. So what are we up against? So, didn't expect that one. <laughs> the problem is that even the good guys don't really get it. The darling of the left, Bernie Sanders, recently voted a highway expansion spending bill out of committee. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has taken heat for her comments that the Green New Deal should involve new roads. 
Uh, governors who control state DOTs across the country have fully bought into the idea that building new roads is the best way to solve congestion. Massive education is needed to bring people up to speed about the harms that a road-based transportation system causes. And of course, there's the all-powerful highway lobby, a constellation of actors from chambers of commerces to the freight and trucking industries to the fossil fuel industries that have a stake in maintaining the status quo. We need to finally sever the link between the transportation industry and the fossil fuel industry. <clears throat> Federal transportation policy needs to deliver tangible improvements to people's lives. It shouldn't be this hard to get basic things like bus service in New York. Access to reliable, affordable transportation is one of the most powerful equalizers that we have, and federal transportation policy needs to treat it as such. The best part about transit is that we know what works. It works around the world. Uh, we don't need additional R&D or investments in exotic technology like the Hyperloop. Uh, we need the political will to get it done. So thank you very much. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Abby Spinnick, and I think I somehow failed to put where I work in either the bio or this. Um, so I should say that I teach um, mainly environmental history at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And I, the, the first two presentations have been very specific and very modern. Um, I'm, I hope you will bear with me as I take you back into history and provide a little bit more of a theoretical thought piece about how we should think of the Green New Deal. Um, more so than, than real policies that you can get behind today. But I, I would argue, as I, well, I tend to argue teaching history in a planning department that I see history as a radical practice. So hopefully I will invite you to join me in that perspective today. So um, since I have the last word here, what I want to do before we open up discussion is to take on the history of the word public in public works. When we in this room use the phrase public works, we're not talking about public ownership per se, but rather technological systems that are seen to be in the public interest or that serve the public good. There has been a lot of interesting work done recently on the intellectual history of phrases like this. I'm thinking in particular of Adam Place's recent excavation of the term natural monopoly to refer to large-scale technological systems like electricity, and his argument that we only interpret natural monopolies as natural within American political economy because we have naturalized ideas about free market economics. In the United States, the ownership, management, and regulation of such large-scale networked systems of public works has often been seen to be in tension with other less tangible public goods central to American life, such as freedom or private industry or economic growth. The way we in this country have navigated such tangible and intangible goods within the design of public works has historically led to messy coalitions of public and private actors public and private capital, and public and private benefits. And so talking about opportunities for public electricity in the Green New Deal requires that we do some significant intellectual work of disentanglement. In that spirit, I want to start with a quick summary of the research I've been doing on the, over the past few years on energy policy in the first New Deal. For the last few years, I've been studying a national scale experiment in community energy ownership in the form of rural electric cooperatives. In the 1930s, vast discrepancies between electricity access in rural and urban America became a proxy for many of the social ills New Deal era reformers wanted to address, from rural poverty during the Great Depression to the existential environmental threats of the Dust Bowl to the international status of the United States as a developing industrial nation. In 1935, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the Rural Electrification Act, which after a year of contentious debates and negotiations about who should own the, the, ener the nation's energy infrastructure, ended up largely providing financing for the development of local cooperatives, which built and maintained electricity infrastructure across a huge expanse of rural America. Today, over 900 of these 
ostensibly nonprofit electric co-ops continue to provide power for 42 million Americans on community-owned lines. So a lot of people aren't familiar with this cooperative sector of the American electricity industry, although you all are now because Dan talked about it. Um, <laughs> um, so allow me to just dwell on a couple of points. Nearly everyone in this sh entire shaded territory receives electricity from a business that, that they own as a cooperative member and in which they have a right to vote on its operations, not by percentage of stock, but democratically, one member per vote. So when I first started studying these co-ops, I was excited that they might be a latent landscape of democratic energy that could provide an alternative to extractive, for-profit, and environmentally destructive norms of investor-owned private utilities. But I quickly found out that they were not in practice functioning as democracies. And in fact, the most exciting work being done in electric co-op territories in the 21st century has been by activists trying to reclaim the democratic potential of these co-ops around local issues of social and environmental justice. So my research has thus become more about how these energy cooperatives became co-opted into other kinds of economic and territorial projects over the last 80 years. And I argue that the particular approach to federal energy financing developed during the New Deal conscripted rural communities into national projects of industrial and economic growth that diminished opportunities for these co-ops to expand local, local autonomy and local self-determination. Despite their democratic rhetoric, I therefore interpret these New Deal energy co-ops as more part of the history of American capitalism than a case study in energy democracy. This has led me to ask more critical and technical questions about how ownership of energy resources is operationalized and what kinds of work claims to public, private, cooperative, or nonprofit status have done in this country. And so to help us think about possibilities for new kinds of electricity in the Green New Deal, new kinds of public electricity in the Green New Deal, I want to situate these federally funded and undemocratic co-ops within a brief history of electricity ownership in the US over the past 150 years. As a networked technology that relied on public space, electricity has always been an issue of concern for the state. When Thomas Edison founded the first commercial electric utility in 1880, the country was embroiled in debates about whether railroads should be nationalized. And if not, then what rights and responsibilities state regulators should have to control the antisocial tendencies of these private companies providing a necessary public service? The question at hand was how could the common citizen participate in the material wealth of industrial modernity? Progressive economist Richard Ely popularized the term natural monopoly, which I talked about earlier, as a way to understand the special role of networked services within American political economy. As part of a broader fight against laissez-faire capitalism and in an effort to create a new economics, Ely became interested in the contradictions of selling networked utilities as commodities in capitalist markets. Public works like railroads, water, electricity could never be a real commodity, Ely and others argued, because the service they provided could not be detached from their sites of production and consumption. The logic of market competition, a benefit for consumers in other contexts, would in this case lead to unnecessary duplication of connected infrastructures which was both expensive and a mess. The question Ely and others posed was how can these new natural monopolies be governed such that, they such that they remain public utilities? That is, so that they don't default to the monopolistic behaviors that the railroads had most recently demonstrated of driving prices up, quality down, and keeping access uneven. There were two obvious solutions, public ownership or public regulation. Many at the time believed that public utilities in the hands of private companies was fundamentally antithetical to democracy. As early as 1881, the first municipal electric utilities were founded by progressive city governments. And by 1900, 710 municipal plants were in operation. Studies of labor conditions at public and private utilities in 1901 found that municipal municipal plants paid their workers 35 to 45% higher on average than private plants with better working conditions and lower rates for consumers. So electricity magnates watched this proliferation of, of municipal power with trepidation. 
As early as 1898, Thomas, Edison, Thomas Edison's protege, Samuel Insull, started advocating for state regulation of public utilities. As historian Richard Hirsch has written about in detail, shrewd power company executives realized that state oversight would legitimate the status of utility companies as natural monopolies and allow them to pursue continued growth and consolidation without public outrage or calls for, for municipal takeovers. Insul and others quickly learned how to influence regulators to tip the scales in their favor against municipal utilities. For example, by pushing for legislation that prevented municipal systems from expanding outside their city limits, say, to rural communities. By the 1920s, municipal power was in decline. By protecting utilities from competition, regulation also made utility stocks and loans safer gambles. In short, making money cheaper for utilities, who started experimenting with financial products in addition to electricity provision. This included their own brand of public ownership. In 1920, or by the 1920s, utility executives saw their stocks passing into the hands of the small investor. They lauded this as, quote, true public ownership under public regulation without sacrificing the initiative and efficiency of private management. Against the resurgence of regional and state power authority plans in the 1920s and 30s, utility managers argued that the threat public power posed was not just to the private companies, but to their millions of stockholders, including the widows and orphans who depended on the safe stock of regulated utilities. So just as a quick aside, one thing I've been writing about lately is how the United States knew it was an outlier in terms of utility policy. A lot of other countries at the time had nationalized their electricity networks. American commissions went abroad to study these systems frequently, and starting in 1924, regularly participated in world power conferences. An organization started after World War I with the idea that freer technological exchange was vital to maintaining world peace, and which delegates by the 1930s referred to as a technical league of nations. Despite these international influences, New Dealers continued to approach private investor-owned utilities as the norm, and focused on expanding high-energy lifestyles as the path to national flourishing, a path which contributed to the environmental and economic situation the Green New Deal is grappling with today. So I have up to this point been talking largely about the ownership of energy infrastructure, power plants, electricity lines, and the like. But what about the ownership of energy resources, the nation's supply of coal, oil, and natural gas? The ownership of natural resources, in my opinion, is one of the best illustrations we have in this country of how property rights are cultural constructs. In the US, we separate surface rights from mineral rights in property ownership. That is, if you own a plot of land, you may just own the surface of it. What lies beneath, the coal, oil, natural gas, water, may not belong to you unless you have also explicitly purchased the mineral rights. Even if you do own your mineral rights, your neighbor may have the right to drill or draw resources from under you. Geographer Matt Huber has written about how the legal structures governing private access to subterranean pools of oil historically has led to rampant overproduction and the glutting of the market. In his 2011 article, Enforcing Scarcity, from which I shamelessly stole this cartoon, um, Huber recovers a particular episode in Texas and, and Oklahoma that led to the declaration of martial law and the forced, the forced closing of thousands of oil wells. This violent episode was not about the management of oil as a resource, but rather the management of it as a commodity. State intervention was required to keep the oil market from collapsing due to oversupply dropping prices below the cost of production. By 1933, there were widespread calls to nationalize the oil industry as a public utility. The idea of oil overproduction is tied to the idea of profit. If oil is to be profitable, then the institutional apparatus built around its production needs to maintain the circumstances that keep oil prices high enough for a profit and low enough for mass consumption. When oil is nationalized, then the bookkeeping becomes different then it becomes part of the economics of the nation in the more classical sense of keeping one's house in order, part of a more expansive calculus that weighs the technical costs of extracting oil from the ground against the environmental and social harm that that extraction entails. 
Again, the ultimate path the United States took to regulate rather than nationalize was a choice in a more variegated international context of state ownership models. The fact that oil has persisted here as private property should give us pause, especially as these rights to so-called fugitive substances like oil and gas that move underground with no regard to, ter to, to terrestrial property lines have increasingly led to well-documented problems of environmental injustice. Okay, so what do mineral rights have to do with public electricity? If the Green New Deal, as many have argued, means a vast expansion of electrified goods, then as with oil, it is in our interest to pay attention to ownership throughout the commodity chains that enable all of that green technology. I worry that by continuing to promote the growth of green energy, green construction, green infrastructure as a path to social justice, Green New Deal advocates are bolstering a cultural script that delays a needed reckoning between American democracy and nature. Energy historians in recent years have highlighted the environmental contradictions inherent in the green economy as a modern manifestation of an American energy exceptionalism, an enduring cultural narrative that we have a right to both pristine nature and unlimited energy. In pursuit of this, the landscape of this nation has been shaped to give the average middle class citizen an experience of energy that feels, in the words of Chris Jones, profoundly immaterial. Of course, this relationship with energy has been achieved largely through the spatial separation of extraction and consumption, made possible in part through federally subsidized networks of power lines and pipelines, and the pervasive marginalization of communities who live in landscapes of energy production. Even if the Green New Deal focuses on reparations for these frontline communities, the question is at what scale? If I can borrow a dystopian vision from sociologist Max Eil, a Green New Deal focused on investments in green energy paired with job creation for the United States, especially in this political climate, could lead to a, a future of fortress eco-nationalism, green social democracy at home, and militarized maritime and terrestrial borders, and beyond them, resource extraction for domestic clean tech. In other words, it doesn't matter if a municipality or a cooperative owns the solar panels that power your Tesla if the electronics that run it reinforce extractive neocolonial practices in the DRC, as urban political ecologist Maria Kaika has recently written about. Or rather, it does matter in the sense that green infrastructure that relies on current global resource markets that take advantage of unequal regulatory regimes to maximize pri private profit makes ideals of American social democracy complicit in reinforcing global resource imperialism and climate apartheid. When you follow the money through the first New Deal's experiments in electricity ownership, it's easy to see how the, priori how the prioritization of economic growth as a public good eroded what we might talk about today as the potential for greater energy democracy. I therefore listen with trepidation to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's reassurance that every dollar of investment in green energy has an expected impact of $9 of economic growth, or in Bernie Sanders' projected 20 million jobs. There's no reason to believe that a Green New Deal that maintains a national growth orientation won't fall into similar traps of inclusion and exclusion except maybe if they read your book, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to. Okay, so what I just said, it's not a unique argument, but thinking about electricity beyond a public utility as a venue of interacting local, national, and global property regimes may help us gain purchase on what we intend to do with public electricity in the Green New Deal. So I wanna end with some questions about ownership, thinking about the Green New Deal internationally. Can we envision new ideas of public ownership that create international coalitions of environmental justice around global resource extraction for a green economy? How can we mobilize forms of ownership to demand that trade enhance global climate justice in addition to decarbonization? Can the commodity networks necessary to, const to construct the 21st century Green New Deal state also be redefined to channel direct reparations for extractive industries both within and beyond our borders. What, and what would that kind of ownership look like? What role can American definitions and practices of property play in constructing these new contracts? The critical question of public electricity for the Green New Deal then, in my opinion, is not one of ownership so much as it is one of power.
So thank you all for coming out. Uh, this has been a really great set of presentations, and I think this is a really wonderful topic because I tend to think of the Green New Deal as um, really a, a, a project of reorienting uh, the relationship of public and private, the, the sort of uh, trend towards privatization we've seen, uh, certainly in this country for the past several decades, um, and, and reclaiming some amount of public uh, control over our uh, social lives, economic order, and, and many other things that um, that our panels have discussed. And so uh, so that's all really great. And I'm going to just start off by um, asking a couple of questions uh, and we're sort of posing some, some topics to the panelists. Um, and uh, then uh, have some questions from the audience. And if folks want to reflect some on the themes uh, yourselves, that would also be great. So. Um, but I'll just start off with, with a few questions to get us going. Um, and the first one, uh, Ryan Holt sort of hinted at in his introductory remarks, and then I think Abby sort of came to it at the end a bit, and it's, it's around sort of the question of the relationship of uh, where does the sort of American Green New Deal uh, stand in relation to the rest of the world? And that I think could take a lot of different forms. So obviously we know that climate change is a, is a planetary phenomenon. Um, that requires, uh, you know, not action only in one country, um, but what does that mean for, for a sort of national program? Um, and I think that there's a, a way of thinking about, certainly I think we've seen references to programs in other countries, whether that's Red Vienna uh, or uh, the sort of comparison of different kinds of energy regimes in, in different countries. Um, but so there's, there's a question of whether, on the one hand, um, there's an American exceptionalism around how we have thought historically about the public and the private, um, around the kinds of you know, housing, transit, energy, whether there are things that America uh, can learn from the rest of the world, certainly. And then I think there's a question of how far some of the things that people are proposing here, that the Green New Deal um, has put forth in the House resolution uh, can, uh, how, where that travels, how much of that can travel beyond the US. Um, but then beside the sort of comparative question of what can we sort of take from one context and move into another, I think there's a question of, of um, you know, how the Green New Deal fits into this, this sort of broader climate program um, that I was just mentioning. And I think um, Abby's comments certainly suggested some of the dangers of having maybe a, a Green New Deal that is focused on promoting um, uh, maybe the well-being of Americans above the rest of the world. But uh, we could... Certainly any domestic program always has ties to the global and to the international, and so uh, where do we see those in these different kinds of programs, and, and how can we think about the relationship of, um, of, what, of what we might be trying to do here and the sort of examples we've heard about here to, to other places? So let's start there. Well, Whoever wants to go. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe I'll just really quickly say that I don't, I'm not concerned about the Green New Deal promoting the welfare of Americans per se, but, the, but more so how it's being operationalized through the idea of economic growth. And how we're still, I still see in the Green New Deal this, this sense that economic growth is a public good. And I think, I think your, your book is going to address that. that so I'm, I'm hoping that more of that conversation becomes part of the Green New Deal. We definitely try to address many, many things in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wants to go, jump in. Yeah, <laughs> okay. really. the transportation component of this is fairly clear cut. The U.S. exceptionalism has gotten us to where we are today, um, and I think you know for other countries grappling with this, well, m transit ridership is fairly healthy in you know <laughs> a vast number of countries around the world, um, and so I think we really need to borrow from you know public policies that encourage transit ridership. Um, like a focus on improving the bus, um, which is often sort of the stepchild of transportation systems. Um, but if you go to places like London, if you go to places like Seoul, it's actually better to take the bus than to take the subway. Um, and so I think that's one area where we really stand to, to learn from the rest of the world. Um, can I, I love the bus. I'm such a huge <laughs> fan of buses. Um, and I, I, I could not agree with you more. Um, <clears throat> I think one lesson we can learn from other places around the world, uh, including Flatbush in Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, with the dollar vans, is that you don't, it doesn't just have to, I mean, the bus is central, but you have in most developing countries, quote unquote, global south countries, a vast spectrum of collective transit sizes. So anybody who's traveled outside the US will know 
that you are sometimes in a big taxi or with many people in it, or you're in a mini van, or you're in like a little mini bus. Um, so I, you know, one of the things that I think we absolutely have to do is nationalize Lyft and nationalize Uber. Um, but it doesn't have to be all run, yes. It doesn't all have to be run by the Department of Transportation. I mean, in the book we talk about why don't places like an Appalachia or indigenous reservations that are small have worker cooperatives running um, like minivans. They would have algorithms developed by the US government, which would be easy, the Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, and you could ride hail, ride hail a minivan. And in Helsinki you had a version of this called Katsa Plus, which was underfunded, but it was essentially like an Uber line type thing, but it was at the minivan level and it was run by the transit authority and just cost a few more dollars if you wanted that convenience. I just want to say quickly on the question of growth. I mean, I worry about a lot of things because I'm a neurotic human <laughs> and I worry about growth. But the US economy, you know, Bernie, the Bernie plan just said they would grow at 5% a year with the stimulus. For, a develop, for like a rich country to grow at more than, than 2 or 3%, it's not really clear that it can. I mean, we haven't seen that in a long time. I sort of feel like to me, the big question, besides not using up tons of resources in other countries to make clean energy here, that's an issue and we talk about it a lot in the book and can get into more now, but what role can the US have in changing a global growth regime where right now economy, like the Chinese economy, the Indian economy are growing in a particular way and are there forms of investment, green investment, that we can contribute to here, not alone, not like the US is going to lead the world, um, but are there forms of investment we can contribute to that will push a kind of global growth model into something more like the temples of public luxury we're talking about here? I mean, if you look at China's Belt and Road Initiative, it's like uh, you know close to a trillion dollars a year in investment. That's a huge amount of money. I mean, that is an absolutely huge amount of money. The U.S. has no business going to China and saying this is what you're going to do instead. But I think we do have an option to try to look globally as we try to develop new kinds of cooperation, new kinds of trade agreements, um, a new model of wealth or something like that to aspire to here. So I think the global conversation is, is complicated and figuring out how to speak to the world in a non-patronizing way um, from here will be difficult but worthwhile. Absolutely. Anyone else want to jump back in on that? Great. Um, <laughs> So the next question I have is about sort of the, the place of, um, I guess what we might call public power or in the sense of political power in this. Uh, and certainly uh, I think, you know, the you know, arguments for more public transit, for more public housing, um, uh, for perhaps certain forms of publicly owned energy, although maybe not in an uncomplicated way, um, are all really compelling. And then the question is, well, how do we actually get these things? Uh, if we think that these are, are goods that we should have, how do we reverse that kind of um, trend of, uh, I think Haley discussed like the vicious cycle of underinvestment in public goods and public transit, that that makes people not like public transit, that then uh, makes uh, reduce, uh, results in uh, even less funding for public transit. And so um, how do we reverse that vicious cycle, turn it into a sort of virtuous cycle in some sense? How do we connect, um, make the case, I guess, for public goods uh, in, our, in our country where public goods have been starved for a long time and um, maybe not only in, in uh, that context, but um, and, and I guess in some really pragmatic sense, um, there was some, you know, I heard uh, a bit in, in all the presentations about sort of uh, an appeal to, um, you know, to to saying, well, here's something like great that you'll, you know, you can get great energy. You'll have, you'll have. Actually, your life will be maybe nicer if you're not driving all the time. Um, obviously, public, you know, the sort of public, the public temples of luxury uh, in Daniel's presentation. Um, so there's this this idea that there's something actually in it for people uh, in in these kinds of public goods. But uh, I'm curious if uh, you've we can get a little more granular maybe on, on how that works and how those sort of political programs work and how we build the, the coalition of, um, of, of the people <laughs> saying we want these things and, and um, actually uh, in a way that we can imagine achieving these and, and putting these into practice. Okay, I'm gonna do something rude, which is disagree with someone who's not in the room. <laughs> so my good friend, Leah Stokes, you can find her on Twitter. She's very popular there. She's a political scientist at UC Santa Barbara. She writes, tweets, uh, researches a lot on climate change policy, um, and she's great. But she has a thing that she's been saying, which is that the Green New Deal lives in the climate plans of the Democratic primary candidates. 
And the idea here is that you know, we had the resolution from AOC and Senator Markey in Massachusetts, but we don't really have a federal policy making for the Green New Deal, obviously, because Trump is in power for now. Um, so she says the, public, the, the policy, the idea lives in the plans. And I would respectfully disagree with her and say it actually lives in the door knocking and in the political meetings of the Democratic primary. Um, it would be ideal if the country had 30% of its workers unionized and they could be a massive political force. But about 6% of private sector workers in this country are unionized. So we don't have a huge number of powerful economic levers outside of the like, corporate world. But what I would argue is that the Democratic primary campaign will take massive numbers of people from rival candidates knocking on doors and having meetings all across the country for an insanely long amount of time. And even though that is very painful, <laughs> it is also an opportunity for like a vast number of essentially one-on-one -on -one conversations and small group conversations. And I would argue that it is in that like massive public mobilization, which every large number of candidates are spending millions and millions of dollars to have more of, that is where we can really, really build conversation, maybe consensus, and different ideas for what the Green New Deal could be. So I would say all of us have an incredible opportunity, actually, in the next 12 months to be part of this big, mobilized, kind of like democratic exercise with all of its flaws. Um, and I don't think the Green New Deal is decided at all. I think it's absolutely up for grabs. And in a weird historical uh, moment of good fortune, it's up for grabs right now in a moment where we all have like way more say than one normally would because it's in primary season and everybody wants somebody to be a part of what's going on. Yeah, I will talk about transit advocacy, which has been uh, pretty anemic in this country, largely because transit riders have lower incomes than drivers, and they don't have the time to show up to meetings and you know raise hell for their elected officials. Um, we're starting to see that change more with organizations like my own, not to tutor on own, but we are funding advocates um, in cities across the U.S. and seeing amazing results. Just even, uh, there's a fantastic group in Cleveland called Clevelanders for Public Transit. And in two short years, they have completely changed the conversation around public transit in Cincinnati. Um, sorry, Cincinnati. Did I say Cleveland? Yeah. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Ohio, too many C's, right? <laughs> um, so, so we are seeing that starting to change. We are not seeing uh, transit advocacy on the national level. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for alliances um, between transit advocates and the labor movement um, because of the sort of stake in creating you know, well-paying jobs um, that you know, an investment in you know, better transit service and better infrastructure could create. Um, there's also an opportunity for alliances um, with the healthcare industry uh, because, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, home healthcare aides are like the fastest growing growing job in the US and they are enduring some of the worst commutes in the country. So I really think there's a lot of opportunity to activate people that haven't uh, traditionally been uh, active in the transit space, but I really want to point out that where we're seeing advocacy, ridership is growing and, we, and we're seeing some of that virtuous cycle that you're talking about where you know, ridership is going up and it's much easier to make the case to elected that they should you know, stick their neck out. Um, so we're really glad to see that happening. Good to hear. <laughs> I feel like I'm always going to have the theoretical answer. <laughs> That's okay, um, I'm a political but, theorist, so like, go for yeah. it. <laughs> but I mean, I guess I'll say that I'm interested in, the, in debt and conversations around debt being more part of the narrative around the Green New Deal and around public funding for things like increased transportation. You, you know, you mentioned the idea that a lot of Americans are still, that they're burdened by debt for to own an automobile and, and um, that 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 could be part of the conversation about shifting to the idea of funding um, more more enjoyable public transportation. When in my research on electric co-ops, the it's I see the failure of the co-op model in this particular case as being related to the particular constraints that came with federal financing, and, and you know there there was all this. Along with federal loans came all of this, all of these best business practices about, you know, how much electricity should cost and how and what the aims for like growing their electrical load should be in order to pay off their debt. And I think that there's a good analogy here between thinking about, you know, mortgages and student debt and, you know, car debt. And I mean, we're, you know, we're sort of. So much of, of 
modern life and the, the, the condition, the, the social conditions that the Green New Deal is attempting to address have to do with inequalities over the, I don't know, the, viol the violence of perpetual debt. And I don't have a good policy solution for this, but I think narratively that could be connected to the idea of what we're funding um, for public services. And then that could be, a, that could be powerful. Yeah, I was really struck by that. Um, Haley sort of pointing to the, the huge amount of debt that people have for, uh, for using cars. Obviously, Daniel's on the housing. And I mean, in, in a way, it's, you know, there's always a question, how do we pay for it? How do we pay for the Green New Deal? But people are paying for the <laughs> privatized services, privatized goods every day. It's just uh, disaggregated and not a gigantic, you know, multi-trillion dollar number for, uh, or, you know, it's, it's, it's split up. And so it's, uh, I think, actually drawing attention to actually the huge amount of debt um, seems really promising and exciting as a, as a way to go, um, particularly amidst sort of conversations about medical debt and student debt and all of these other um, forms of debt that have, uh, in many ways, fueled um, consumption and growth for the past 40 years in the absence of uh, wage wage growth. Um, and on the on the issue of wage growth, actually, my next question was going to be on. Um, and this is the last question I'll ask before I open up to to the audience. So start getting your questions ready, uh, or comments, or thoughts, or whatever uh, contributions you want to make. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask you all was about uh, public work uh, and work in the sense of labor. Um, and we heard some about um, labor and certainly some of the descriptions of the courses, all of which sound really great and exciting. Um, and I, I was thinking, I mean, I think a lot about labor and, and the Green New Deal and uh, labor and other things too, but uh, particularly around the Green New Deal and green jobs and all this discourse. And so I was curious a bit, um, if you could each maybe just like reflect a bit on what you think, um, sort of how you think uh, the, the jobs question, which has been so significant in a lot of climate policy, environmental policy, and the Green New Deal discussion, um, uh, and which I think is, is an important question, and all of this sort of, I guess, intersects with or connects to each of the, the topics. And, um, I think that could be, you know, what, what kinds of jobs do we imagine coming along with these? What kinds of uh, knowledge or skills we might need to, to develop these new forms of public works to, uh, to live in these new public spaces and so on? Um, what do we need? What kinds of work are we not doing that we need to do? But maybe also a question of what kinds of work uh, public, the public goods we're discussing, the public works we're discussing might displace and how we can deal with that. So I was thinking actually about like, you know, if we get rid of highways, probably there'll be a problem with, you know, um, I'm sure truckers won't love that, you know? Um, and so it's like, how do we think about, um, as we're thinking about how to build political uh, constituencies, political coalitions around these, um, how are we thinking about, uh, you know, the, the ways that these changes um, might negatively impact some groups of people and how we can bring uh, those people into um, our vision in, in a way. So whoever wants to start with that one. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I'll tell a little story. So um, I'm Canadian. I grew up in Toronto. Congratulations, Daniel. Um, and my brother, Seth, is also Canadian, but he lives here now. And uh, he lives in Carroll Gardens, miraculously. And he's a grip, which means that he works on movie sets and is very good with his hands and is in a trades union, which is, um, has its issues. Um, anyway, but it's a good union. Uh, and my brother sort of told me a story recently about how the house next to his, the one that he lives in in Carroll Gardens was recently gut renovated. And my brother was just like shocked. And he was describing to me, he's like, Daniel, they had all this molding that had been built by the finest artisans of the late 19th and early 20th, early 20th century, like really beautiful, ornate work it needed to be patched up, but done by really good craftsmen. And it was just completely wiped out to make an empty box. And my brother, who works with his hands for a living, was just appalled. Like, it just killed him that that was happening. And I give this example because one of the things that I've learned about as I've been doing you know, more historical research on Red Vienna since visiting is that the, a lot of the public housing in Red Vienna that was built in the 20s at the time was considered to be kind of like laughably old fashioned. It had a sort of like ornate quality that was not in fashion with the more advanced, quote unquote, you know, so socialist thinkers in places like Frankfurt, who had a more kind of austere, modernistic concept of what social housing should be like. But the reason that the, the housing was like this in Vienna is because there were all these craftsmen who didn't have jobs. And the idea was, our public money, we have to get the best architects to compete, and we have to do a form of building which is also beautification, and which 
creates a form of labor which is sort of beautification intensive. So the doorknobs were all made in factories. You had entire companies that were servicing the housing of Red Vienna, just creating doors, doorknobs, sort of basic things. But anything that had a kind of public facing character um, and that could be done by a craftsman, they wanted to make that beautiful. And the reason I'm saying all this is I think about my brother and I think about the debates about trades work and other building trades and the Green New Deal. And I think about what it means to do work that is not resource intensive, but that creates these temples of public luxury. And I think like we have sort of lost the notion of beautification in contemporary architecture often. And so what does it mean to rethink the physical landscapes that we want in terms of absorbing work by being beautiful and that being a kind of work that people want to do, right? And if you're talking about sand dunes uh, in beaches to help absorb floodwaters, about creating marshes, housing, transit, and so on, all the physical changes we have to make for the Green New Deal, which is essentially a physical reconstruction of the entire built environment, there are opportunities for beautification and for, I think, a kind of labor that's sort of been lost and that we are in some ways right to romanticize. And I think the people that I know, including my brother, who do work with their hands, would love the opportunity to spend more time making things beautiful and things that last. Um, and those are, I think, you know, values of physicality that are very much things that designers can think about and contribute to and that are absolutely consistent with the best ideals of a Green New Deal. I'm really excited thinking about all the beautiful bus stops we're going to see as part oh my of God, this. So beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> I said I'm excited to think about the beautiful bus stops that we'll see if we commit ourselves to you know, beautiful public goods. Um, we are really, at Transit Center, we're really excited about the possibility of you know, infusing transit agencies with operating money to uh, you know, create a lot of well-paying jobs. Um, and you know, these are jobs like operating a bus, which currently are not always great jobs, um, but they can be. Um, and uh, also, Green New Deal just for sidewalks would create thousands of jobs. I mean, do you know how much of America has no sidewalks? It would, and, and projects that you know, add walking and biking to existing road space create a ton of jobs. Um, so I, I don't wanna paint too rosy of a picture of it, um, but I think that it is a tremendous opportunity in the transit and um, you know, walkable streets arena. Green New Deal for sidewalks. That t-shirt yeah. would sell. <laughs> it's a great slogan. I, I'd like to see a cultural shift towards having the practice of politics and deliberation about what it means to be a citizen and ideas of democracy to have a place in the workplace. And maybe this is through unions or maybe it's through, I don't know, federal funding for corporate reform of some sort, but I mean, there are a couple of arguments for this, one of which is that I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying not to devalue de-skilled labor, and even calling it that is, okay, so I need a, I need a way to talk about this, but the, a lot of the jobs that we talk about as, as being sort of dead ends and, and um, you know, that are behind fights for a higher minimum wage, um, for a broader social safety net, they can also be made more, they can also be made more elevated through opportunities for more, more worker engagement in the structure of, of the corporation or the structure of their industry. And we've really separated that in the US over the past 100 years. Um, I'll just say that, that a, lot of the, a lot of the terminology I was talking about in my talk, the idea of public utilities, natural monopolies, you know, the regulatory compact, things like this, came out of, or early theory about them came out of an intense period of labor organizing during, um, during the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. And there's no reason why, I mean, I, I guess I would like to see more of a, more cultural norms around that kind of theoretical work around the economy coming out of, out of labor. Sounds great to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's like, I'm, yeah. I'm all like, no, you know, from no. 30,000 feet up and not talking about actual programs, but. No, 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 that's, that's totally, I think it's good to have a mix of different ways we're thinking about this, and I absolutely agree that it would be great to see, um, you know, uh, to remember that there have been times when the labor movement has really been a source of how we think about the economy mm -hmm. and, and has been really part of that um, 
how we understand and make sense of the economy and the you know intellectual life in a, in a real way, and I think that is very possible again. So, um, oh, wait, hold on, Osa. Since you yourself have written many of the leading articles about the relationship between work and the Green New Deal, and in particular care work and green jobs, I feel you would really be ruining everybody's afternoon if you didn't tell them a little <laughs> bit of your own thinking on this and answer your own question. Um, well, I'll say, so I'll just say a couple of things. Well, um, uh, thanks for putting me on the spot, first of all. I'm supposed to be just a questioner. Um, so I've, I've written a bunch about, uh, mostly about sort of thinking about care work as a kind of green job and, and care work and other kinds of jobs and sort of social reproduction as being um, low carbon work that is life improving and quality of life um, improving and kind of can maybe move away from at least uh, resource growth and things like that. Um, while still improving people's lives. Uh, and so I was actually really interested when you just mentioned the home health aids being a potential source of like organizing around transit. That seems like a really exciting point of intersection to me because um, uh, yeah, like it's the top 10 jobs of growth every year, basically some kind of nurse or a health aide or something. Um, and especially home health aides are, you know, tend to be paid very low wages and have really bad working conditions. And um, I had actually not really thought about transit as being part of that, but of course, <laughs> um, that makes so much sense. And that's that's actually a really exciting point of overlap um, to me, and so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and it was also really cool to see in uh, one of the the courses, the you know, the the daycare facility as part of uh, how we're thinking about public works. Um, um, and I absolutely think that things that are trying to integrate public spaces um, and care work uh, as both elements of sort of our public goods, public services, um, seems actually absolutely <laughs> vital to me uh, and, and like a really exciting uh, place where some of the themes of this, of today's conversation can come together. Um, so, and there's, you know, always more to say about labor, but those are the two I'll say now, so. Hello, thank you. <clears throat> this is very edifying. My name is Judy Richheimer. I have a quick comment for Ms. Richardson and a question for Mr. Cohen or wh whomever would like to wrangle it. Uh, my comment to Ms. Richardson is I am completely on your side in terms of uh, uh, putting greater emphasis on public transportation and downplaying automobile culture, but I disagree that busways should be exempt from environmental review, if only because the more democracy, the more democratic process we have going for us, the better our messaging can be. And for Mr. Cohen, pulling out from your very interesting observation about old buildings, I know that preservationists and architects are very often at one another's throats when it comes to who is better for and what is better for the environment. Architects say, oh, our new buildings can, have, uh, can use this fabulous new glass, for example, that is you know, better at retaining energy. And preservationists say, oh, but our old buildings have good old brick that has built-in climate control and windows that open. So my question is, is the preservation department, which is part of this school, part of this concerted effort? Uh, my name is Len Mel, and uh, you've done a great job on um, making me understand how problematic the New Green Deal is, even more than almost any, anyone would suspect. You have a whole notion of reconceptualizing it that's not really, but I think I applaud it, but that's not really, you know, well known. And so my s simple question, so to speak, is the level of anxiety. In other words, all of these questions are raising levels of thought that really are not part of the public discussion. And if you add to that things like the financial situation, with the overnight markets freezing, and other concerns, I I'm worried about the kind of demagogic situation that will arise when this much anxiety on even within a certain position starts to come out and that people start to look for simple you know strong men answers or strong women uh, and so I wonder if you, any of you have just thought about the level of anxiety that's going to raise on multiple fronts and what we can think 
did a great job of historically looking at this. What happens historically when you raise so much anxiety and so much conflict and how we should deal with that? So I think there's a meta level to try to deal with this before it spins out of control. And I think it's, I think it's optimism, but I hope it's true, um, which is that I think that perspective, respectfully, is a form of prejudice about the capacity for civic engagement. I, I think that we can, and, and this relates to my argument about the need for, I don't know, civic education and political discourse to be more a part of our everyday life. I don't think the public needs simple, strong men narratives or strong women. I mean, it, what I, I hope that one thing we can do in, you know, I, I think everyone up here thinks that the Green New Deal is a, is a great policy framework. And what we're trying to do is, I mean, to some extent, this is a sympathetic audience. I assume that most of you are here because you, you believe in the project. And so this is the kind of audience where we should be hashing out these differences and, and the details, like doing this very detailed technical work. But I also don't think that we should shield this from the public. I guess the, the challenge for us is to try to figure out how to make complexity not, not anxiety filled. But to see it as necessary experimentation. I mean, the, the, new, the New Deal was all about experimentation, and they said that very explicitly. You know, they said that, and it, and it was contradictory, and some programs dismantled the work that others were doing. But they saw what they were doing as, you know, so, some things would fail, um, and that was okay. May, I mean, maybe it wasn't okay to the general public, but the, the policy culture of the New Deal was that it was okay to try things and have them fail. And I, I don't, I don't, I feel like I don't see that enough in public discourse and I hope that we can figure out some way to shift that conversation. Um, I'll just respond to the comment about uh, best priority projects and environmental review. There is a, um, a best priority project here in New York on 14th Street that has been proposed since the Bloomberg administration and was finally put into action this year to coincide with the L train shutdown. A group of folks that live uh, near 14th Street um, have essentially weaponized the environmental review process in order to hold up the project, even though it was 10 years in the making. Um, a judge just ruled today that the project can proceed. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that we can't have happen if we have any chance of meeting the IPCC targets. Um, so yes, democracy, yes, but some things just have to be pushed through. <laughs> um. Yeah, just very quickly, I mean, yes, I mean, we're going to have to learn how to have faster democracy, and sometimes that, that means faster. Um, uh, you know, look, I mean, I'm not in a design school, so wading into a fight between preservationists and architects, that's like going to somebody else's Thanksgiving, um, <laughs> and just like picking a side and digging in. So I'll just criticize the whole thing and say, I think from the outside, design strikes me as having a very contradict. The design professions say two things that are very contradictory. One is we have magical tools, capabilities, forms of thought that allow us to solve problems that other mere mortals couldn't possibly comprehend. <laughs> and then the next thing that they say when you push them on it is, oh, well, my private client wouldn't pay for that. Um, and so the best contributions of preservationists, preservationists and architects will never come to pass unless the model of the client shifts from the rich person who says, you're gonna to get to do the coolest curves if you work with me, or you'll get to preserve the coolest fireplace if you work with me, and the client has to shift to the public and to social movements and to labor movements and racial justice movements. So the big change that design school needs to make is not reallocating power within itself. I don't know, you guys can sort that out, but to subject yourselves to a different kind of power, which is not the power of private money or the idea that philanthropy is the way to you know, do an end run on the market and get everything that you want. Um, so I'm Rosalie, I'm a PhD student in urban planning. Um, I study buses, they're great. Um, but, so I wanted to sort of take, so when you said the future of the Green New Deal lies in the door knocking of the Democratic primary, my heart sank. The idea of like, this one sort of national election determining the future of this policy 
is really scary. But then Haley said, well, it's okay because we're organizing in cities all over the country to make a lot of these things a reality. So I guess I would like to hear a little bit more about the geography of a Green New Deal. And in particular, we've talked a lot about national. The old New Deal was national. We could nationalize Uber, but we could also have it incorporated in every single city's municipally owned transit app. Yeah. Um, so sort of how do we think about the geography and the rules that need to change in order for us to sort of change our democratic geography? Um, I'm in the architecture pro program here. Um, I'm from Vienna. <laughs> Which is not what my question is going to be about. <laughs> it is. It is very great, but there's also a lot of problem problems that you didn't um, address. But I will let everyone believe that it is really great. <laughs> um, my question is for, I guess, Haley and Daniel. Both of you said that housing and transportation should be, or the Green New Deal should be looked at through the lens of housing and, to, and transportation. I think you would probably both agree that housing and transportation are linked very heavily and um, you both have a big problem area which is the suburbs. Um, and I'm wondering how the Green New Deal or public works should address um, suburbs or low density, high capital areas. How do you satisfy the needs of these people with public programs? Do you do public housing that is single family or, and, and do you make bus lines for areas that are really not very efficient in terms of public transport? Um, okay, is it true that in Vienna public transit costs a euro a day if you get a subscription? Yeah. When I, the guy showing me around was like, you wouldn't believe it, Daniel, there are days when the bus doesn't even come in seven minutes. And I was like, wow, sounds rough. But no, there are undoubtedly big problems in Vienna. There's, there's no question. Yeah, um, I mean, so quickly, yeah, how's, I, there are a lot of things that we can do in the suburbs, and some of them we talk about in the book around like the idea of minivans that you would call because a big double bus obviously isn't going to work. Um, I have an article in Jacobin called Seize the Hamptons where I discuss the pathologies of densification in suburbs in Ontario where what the model is essentially Walmart uh, Walmart A, Walmart B, Walmart C, a bunch of residential towers, and then a bus rapid transit line, where the hashtag uh, in, in Ontario is the new, hashtag the new me time. That's how they're going to sell people on bus rapid transit. Um, so there is a form of even suburban densification, which is all premised on, um, which is all premised on consumption, and I argue that an alternative form, and I talk about a different suburb in Toronto, which they've densified around a public theatre called the Rose Theatre uh, in Brampton, and which I argue is like a different model where culture and cultural activity, which is of course low carbon, you know, is the real model, and anyway, blah, blah, blah. You should read the article, it's really, I think, my best piece of work. Um, <laughs> seize the Hamptons, yeah, you'll find it. Um, briefly, I mean, I think that it's obviously, it's okay, so it would be depressing if the whole thing hinged on the next election at the same time, like we're in an emergency, so like I wouldn't recommend losing that election. Um, <laughs> but second, yes, I mean, I think the organizing has dividends beyond the national election, and I guess that's my point. Like there is a big national mobilization that is just built into the political structure and we shouldn't skip it. And then I guess the third thing is, you know, I live in Philadelphia now and it's different. Um, Pennsylvania cannot self-fund a Green New Deal. And red states and purple states really are gonna depend on national policy because you can do some things in Pennsylvania, but New York, California, there are states that can really do a lot with their own resources. And there are a lot of parts of the country which tend to be essentially ruled by really horrible people who take advantage of the poverty of their constituents um, to ram through very right-wing policies. And without massive federal investment, I'm not sure that you're gonna get the changes you need there. And the long-term danger, I think, is eco-apartheid. So, um, both within places like New York City, but also between regions. So I think we really have to fight for the national policy. When pe cities can lead, sure, but when you leave the rich blue states, you really, I think, come to appreciate the necessity for federal green investment at a very massive scale to restructure um, the built environment and, and our social relations. So I don't know, I think it's good news because I think the Washington Post finds that 50% of teenagers are terrified of climate change and a quarter of them have engaged in some form of climate action in the last year. So, you know, if we defer to teenagers, it's amazing how good things could become. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, at the talk, was it last week at UPenn? Was that just last week? September 13th. Um, every day is a century. Yeah, there was some talk about the idea that you know maybe enough states will do a Green New Deal of their own that will sort of force the federal government's hand. And I, I think you're right. We really underestimate how hostile 
some of these places are to you know public expenditures. Um, I'm really glad you asked about housing and transit. Um, we just had a panel about it actually. Um, so the first thing that we need to do um, is to make it legal to build more housing in yeah. cities <laughs> and to enable anybody that wants to live in a city to be able to afford to do that. Um, Minneapolis just passed really sweeping legislation that um, basically allows you to build any type of housing anywhere, um, which is a direct you know, response to single family zoning that um, you know, has prevented densification um, from happening, and we really hope to see that in more places. Um, so in terms of suburban transit, it's really hard to serve the suburbs. Um, that's, just, that's just a fact. And I think there are some transit agencies who are starting to respond to the suburbanization of poverty um, that we're seeing now by you know, attempting to run more service in the suburbs. And you know, that's, that's a choice. And I think that we'll have to reevaluate what productivity means um, if we're going to offer you know, classic transit service in the suburbs. But there are also you know, things you can do to make it more viable, um, like I was talking about building sidewalks, adding curb cuts, adding crosswalks, or you know, enable people to walk to transit. Um, there's also an interesting um, federal transportation program that would, um, it's not very well utilized, but basically you know, cul-de-sacs are about the worst thing that transit could be asked to serve. Um, so sort of m building new roads through cul-de-sacs that would allow you know, a, a bus not to have to make a trip into a cul-de-sac and then come back. And so you know, that would really improve efficiency. But you know, I'm not going to lie, it's going to be a really difficult challenge. There are you know, folks who will say, oh, with autonomous micro transit, we'll be able to serve the suburbs. And like, that's totally baloney. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Can I just qu quickly add on the topic of what Alyssa was saying earlier also? Like, Dolores Hayden is a fantastic architectural historian and has written tons of books and discussions of what it would mean to both make urban spaces more feminist, but also the different ways that you would transform suburbs. Um, like, so she talks about how you would knock down all the walls between gardens rather than tr try to revitalize street life, because there's actually more physical potential already for common spaces in the backyards if you deprivatize them. So I don't know, I think the work of Dolores Hayden in general is like under appreciated these days and speaks to a lot of the things that we've been talking about. And I'll just add that states like California are really thinking about how to um, you know, densify around transit. And you know, there's, there's a bill in the California state legislature that would mandate you know, upzoning near transit. And as you might expect, it's running into a lot of um, obstacles. Um, but recently, the governor has said that he'll cut off transportation funding for cities that don't meet their housing goals. So I do think that we have, have reached a crisis point where we're going to start to see some um, changes. All right, I think we have time for one last round of questions. So uh, let's see. Um, hi, I'm Sushmita. I'm an urban design student. Uh, so we talked about how the federal policy and the FDA funding kind of delays uh, most of the transit projects through like time consuming and expensive environmental reviews. Uh, so do you think giving more power to local uh, transit agencies could bring about a change? And uh, also, if you give power to local transit agencies, how do you think we can bring about a coordination between like, different local agencies? And how, how can that work? Hi. Yeah. Oh, oh we're doing two. Yeah, two. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm an MOC student, and I've got a question for Abby. Um, so you briefly mentioned the, the kind of dystopic scenario, right, um, in terms of the energetic industry. And to clarify, I'm not too sure I understood you, but are you saying that the green, the green sector um, of energy understood as an autarkic endeavor, so a strictly American thing, which is kind of what the Green New Deal, is, it's not what it says in the text, but it poses America as a leader in the industry. So it kind of goes in that direction, but so is that idea of autarky something that is dangerous if we mismanage it? Is that what you're saying? And how should we regulate this, this new sector without violating kind of the core American values? Which is kind of what the Green New Deal does anyway. I mean, it's, it's highly socialist, but I'm sure that there's a way of doing policy that kind of... Um, does it in a soft way, if you see what I mean? Um, 
So yes, absolutely, we should just give transit agencies money and we should also give them money to run service. So as I mentioned, the FTA stopped providing transit agencies with operating assistance in the 90s. Um, and so we're proposing uh, to change that and to at least provide matching funds for operations, um, you know, so that agencies don't get completely on the hook to the federal government. Um, but that's one of the ways that we think that we're most excited about is just increasing the amount of transit service. Um, so direct money to transit agencies to run more service would change the game. I was really just trying to draw attention to the, the fact that the green economy still relies on resources. And a lot of the resources that go into, I don't know, like electronics and energy efficiency, or ener like green energy projects, um, still rely on global commodity chains that take advantage of extractive industries in countries that have different labor practices, different um, regulatory regimes, and different modes of ownership. And so my question was, if we're thinking about the Green New Deal as a, as a time to rethink forms of ownership, to think about more cooperatives in the US, to think about you know, municipal, municipal utilities, um, maybe even nationalizing things like our electricity grid or our oil resources, then how can we use those, those politics around what ownership can do in, in a global sense? So can, can we think about ownership as intersecting scales of I'd, all of the different entities that are at, at play in a commodity chain that stretches from, you know, mines in the DRC to the solar powered car in, or the solar, let's say the, sol, the solar powered bus um, in, its, in its own bus lane. Are there ways to think about ownership that transcend national boundaries? And what, what would that look like? So um, I think we're about out of time. I just want to invite the panelists to maybe if you have any closing remarks uh, or final thoughts that you want to share with our audience before we wrap up. Um, there was a great quote uh, that you guys have all seen because you were probably at the UPenn event. But um, when FDR said, you know, something like, I don't, I want to do this, but you have to make me do it. I think it's so important to think about that. Like, we have to make this a problem for our elected officials. We can't just, you know, assume that they'll do it out of the goodness of their hearts. That's not how it works. Um, okay, I guess I would just make two plugs. So the first is for our book. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have a whole chapter um, on the need to recharge internationalism. And what we mean by that is, Look, if you take lithium, which is absolutely essential for rechargeable batteries, which is kind of a big deal for an electric economy, um, yes, you have cases like in the north of Chile where the mining of lithium is extremely problematic. And so we need, we argue in the book, both to reduce the energy demand in the United States, we have to reduce the reliance on batteries through things like solar homes, which allow demand response flexibility to um, govern energy use rather than just storing it up and then using it and storing it up and using it. Um, but we also talk about the need for chains of solidarity all across the supply chain, you know, from communities in Chile to labor unions who would be fighting over the conditions of working here. Um, we talk about the need to redo trade relations. There's already been a really interesting proposal for a Geneva Principles for global trade, for a global Green New Deal. So I think, you know, one could be surprised by how quickly and how these conversations are growing and how sophisticated the conversations are because, in fact, this isn't new but there are decades of struggle already around efforts to, you know, and the food sovereignty movement is classic, decades of struggle already on how to change the way things are made uh, all across the chains that connect, you know, consumers in the West, uh, producers in other parts of the world, um, and so on. So I think, you know, our book takes it up. It's a really important question, um, but there is thought about it, and I think that's exciting. And that feeds into my second plug, which is just for the <laughs> Green New Deal. Um, you know, a year ago, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was not a representative, um, and we weren't even having this conversation. Um, Ten years ago, in 2009, uh, the Bloomberg regime in New York City tried to pass far-reaching um, 
legislation to limit the amount of carbon emissions from buildings. And at that time, the Real Estate Board of New York said, we don't want to do it, and it died. Um, and a decade later, just before Earth Day uh, in city council, um, a new bill, even more aggressive to reduce building uh, energy emissions in New York, the most aggressive bill in the country to slash carbon emissions, was passed. And the Real Estate Board of New York was still opposed. The single most important political act in New York was opposed, and the bill passed anyways 45 to 2. And a very important reason that it passed is the housing movement in New York got involved in this fight, and the city councilor who led this bill, whose last name is Constantinidis, on the, house, on the floor of city council said, we need to pass legislation so that um, mothers putting their children to bed at night don't worry about rising sea levels evicting them from their homes, and don't worry about rising rents evicting them from their homes. And so they put together a bill that would dramatically reduce building emissions and protect, protect affordable housing at the same time. And the coalition behind that bill, labor groups, progressive groups, progressive politicians, housing movements, is the Green New Deal coalition. So it's not enough, but I think it is insane to actually think about where were we a year ago, where are we now? If we think about the, this rate of political change, that is nonlinear, and there is an ability that we still have to really, really, really shape this thing and to make it happen, and I don't know, it's not often that you wake up in this kind of like world historical moment. Now you are, so like drink that coffee early in the morning <laughs> and like get to work, and we have like a whole world to rebuild, and it's an extremely exciting time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and on that note, I'll just say thank you um, for organizing this, and that all of you who are part of this incredible academic project of coordinated classes around the Green New Deal should recognize that you are also part of this world historical moment and that it's it's an it's a policy framework that's being formulated right now and that what is happening here is unique and you should see that as an opportunity to really think seriously about how what you're doing in these classes could translate into policy and and see that as an invitation um, to be creative I think that's a great note to end on. So please join me in thanking our panelists, thanking uh, our uh, faculty for teaching our courses.